Okay, so welcome everyone to this session about uh, data storage, sharing, and access. So the goal of the, this session is to share tools, tips, and tricks uh, related to the storage, the transfer, and the sharing of uh, scientific data. Uh, so there are three topics, so there will be three parts of this presentation. And now we start with the storage. And I'm sure you know about file systems where you store files, but there are other types of storage, which I would like to show you, object stores and databases. And this would be the first, first time. So you know what a file system is. You know it looks like a hierarchy of directories and files, and you write it as a file, and the file is present in some directory. And this is the most basic way of organizing data on the disk. You will write data to your file and you save your file in the file system. But you see here three other types of storage systems. Here, also a very old system, the relational database, which is the type of system which is used most time in behind the website and so on. Here, the data is organized a bit differently. You see it's not a hierarchy, it's, it looks more like uh, tables. I will show a bit later on. These two types of storage are a bit more recent. The object store, which is the type of storage which for uh, the closed most of the time, you will see that it can hold files, but more than files, it can hold files and metadata. And then the NoSQL, not only SQL. Um, this is a type of databases that have very specific features. Uh, aimed for very specific types of data. And you will see that there are here in this category tools that can be beneficial for uh, scientific data. But first, I would like to talk a bit more about file systems as soon as the slide goes on. Actually, the file system is very old technology, and you see that the generation zero, if you want, of file systems was basically no file system. So the data was dumped on uh, the the punch cards or the audio cassette, and there were there was no organization of data. So if you did not know what you were looking at, you could not look at it. And then more and more metadata was added to it, and more and more features. And nowadays we are using generation five uh, file systems with uh, copy and write, public checksum, volume management, um, very advanced feature that help us manage the files. Uh, most of the time, we are using ZFS in a cluster for the full file system. So, this is a local file system. So, the file system that is present on the disk when you have a disk in your laptop or your desk station, uh, the files are organized according to this uh, file system. When you are looking at a cluster, you know that cluster is multiple machines and they're connected together with the network. So we have also network file systems. These types of file systems, we call it NFS, is a file system that is exported, as we say, by one machine towards multiple machines. So the clients, as we call them, mount the storage system of the server. And here on the cluster, we have um, typically NFS servers for the boom file system, so that the same files can be seen from all compute nodes in the cluster. So here we are in the situation of uh, one server, one provider and multiple clients, but you can also have multiple providers and multiple clients. So multiple servers that offer the files and multiple clients that read or write the files. And there are Several options for this type of file systems. We often use PGFS on most of the CC clusters where there is a global scratch global file system. You will see that it uh, is uh, GPFS. Maybe you've heard also of the global CC file system where the files can be seen on all the compute nodes of all the CC clusters. And this is thanks to a GPFS file system. And then there's an final type of file system, which is not really uh, designed to hold data on disk, but rather to hold data on memory. And that is important to know. You can write files to disk. That is the basic options that you will take most of the time. But you can also write files 
to memory and that is very fast so of course if the power shut down or if the computer restarts you lose the file so this is only for temporary storage i will show you a bit later on so if you look at a typical cluster here i have a schematics of the metal tree so the clusters that we have here at ucl you see that there's an nfs uh, of 35 terabytes for the home storage so one machine used by all the compute nodes compute nodes which each have a local file system so here's an xfs <clears throat> and then you have the global scratch which is this large box here with all the disk and we have four servers offering a bgfs file system of uh, nearly 600 terabytes well actually we have to scale that down due to hardware failures so it's more about uh, 400 terabytes. so um but you see that on the cursor we have multiple types of file system and it's important to know which type of file system to use for which type of data or for which type of usage if you look on the metal tree and you are connected it looks like this you can use the df command to list all the file systems that are available it, the, the command will show you the local file system but also the remote file system so the network file systems here i'm just using options to show it in a way which is uh, interesting and so you see that there's a x4 file system this is the file system we have on the disk. you see multiple nfs file systems so file systems which are mounted from a remote computer you see the home directory is an nfs file system and you see also was it the BGFS file system here. So the global scratch. This is what we call the mount point. So it's the directory in the hierarchy of directories of the node where the, the files offered by these providers is uh, found. And you see also the CCO for those of you who used that already. It's also uh, NFS here because of the structure that is based on DPFS for the NFS exchange. This gives you the size and then the used and available volumes, so the number of terabytes and gigabytes that are available. And if you specify the dash i option, it uh, shows you also the number of i nodes. And basically, just to simplify, number of i nodes is uh, the number of files. So when you have a file system, data is organized on the disk into a label and then several partitions and each partitions you have multiple zones and a zone is a super block with some information about the zone itself and then an inode bitmap data bitmap and then inode blocks and data blocks so these are basically the addresses of information in those blocks so you see we have data so the file itself and then inode which is meta information about the file for instance, the group ID, the owner ID, the permissions, the file, whether it's a file directory or a simple link, anything like this, and the number of and links to the data box. So it's important because <clears throat> when we uh, create a file system, we need to fix in advance most of the time the number of file nodes. And when we run out, out of, when, we, when we run out of file nodes, actually the file system is considered full, even if Physically, there's still room for gigabytes or terabytes. If we don't have any inodes, we don't have the capacity to store uh, multiple more files. So it's also important to look at the capacity in terms of gigabytes, terabytes, and so on, and the capacity in terms of inodes. So uh, here is a, a small graph to show you what file system to use for what usage. You see here the file size with the large files this way and small files this way. And here, the IOs, so the number of input output of per operation per second that you need to perform. For instance, when you read the file <coughs> from uh, start to finish, and it's a very small file, it can be simply one IO. But if you are reading in a file at multiple uh, places and writing at multiple places, you are um, consuming multiple IOs. So if you have very large files which you do not read or write frequently, 
the type of storage for which it's useful is mass storage. So if uh, uh, you have very large dark GZ archives with the results from previous publications that which you need to store for a long time, the correct storage is the mass storage. If you have very large files, but you are writing and reading uh, uh, in it with uh, jobs that are running on the cluster, the, the global scratch is a correct place to, to put them. If you have data that, that are a bit smaller, but you really need to write and read frequently from it, then it's better to go not on the global scratch, but on the local scratch. So you <clears throat> use the local the disk, which is local to the machine. So you don't use a network. It's much faster most of the time, but it's local to the machine. So if you go to the machine, you lose uh, access to it. So the idea is that when you have data which you need to write very fastly or read very fastly, you first put it in the local fast storage in the local scratch. Maybe from the global scratch or from your home. And then you work on it on the computer. And when you are done, you migrate it back to either the global scratch or the home file system. And the home file system um, <clears throat> is mostly designed for code, web uh, uh, configuration files, and so on. There is a quota on this file system, so you cannot store as much of it as you want. Uh, but there's no quota on the global scratch, so you can put there any amount of data you want. But once in a while, when the uh, uh, usage of the global scratch becomes too big, we uh, delete everything. So it's called scratch because there's no guarantee that we will not scratch everything uh, at some point. And then I was talking a bit more about, uh, a bit earlier about in memory file systems on every compute node. If you need to create a file and you know that the creation will be very, very uh, IO demanding, you will have a lot of input output. Uh, to the file, you can first create the file purely in memory, do all the operations with the very fast bandwidth of the memory, and then store the file to a real file system for it. I will not go further uh, on this topic because actually Ariel will discuss this in length in the session after this one. So he will explain all the type of storage that we have on the CC clusters and what to do with them. So rather, I will speak a bit about file formats, because when you create a file, you need to decide a format of the file. You need to decide how information inside the file is organized. And I will first talk about text file formats, because I'm sure uh, it's the most uh, known to you. So here I have listed several very typical file formats for text. We have here JSON, YAML, XML, and any or Tumblr. So these are standard standardized way of organizing information in text files. This is uh, not easy to read or write for a human, but it's very fine for a computer. JSON is the same uh, ID, so much more uh, computer oriented. When web services exchange data between them, they use the JSON most of the time. And YAML is a bit in between, easier for human to read and process, uh, but it's not entirely uh, completely determined for a computer. So some computers might uh, misinterpret the data in the YAML. Uh, and then the <coughs> ini or Tumblr uh, uh, file format is the one that you will see in most configuration files. It's uh, simpler than those three formats, but it's also easier to produce as a human. So the recommendation here is if you need to write data uh, or results or whatever in the files, <clears throat> try to see if there's an already existing file format that suits your needs and use the libraries that try to read those file formats rather than inventing a new file format. The idea is that if you choose one of those file formats, you can benefit directly from the libraries that can read and, and uh, write them. So you don't need to write the code to uh, write the file. And also you can share them with other people and say, okay, the file format is JSON or YAML. And the other person will be able in all the languages of, of, the, of the world to, to read and import the data uh, in their program. 
So these are uh, um, <clears throat> five formats that are suitable for either uh, configuration or parameters. But if you have data and you want to write it in a text file format, you most of the time will use uh, CSV. So comma separated values on the books like this. Maybe you've seen this already. If you export uh, data as a text from Excel, you will see this kind of file, of file format where you have a first line with uh, typically column names. And then uh, in the columns, you have information, either text or numbers, and it's all separated by uh, codes and uh, the name. This is very nice because it's very easy to see, to read, and to modify. You can import it in Excel or in Office and modify it and then save it back or in any text editor. The drawback is that to store a number, it takes multiple bytes, even if the number could be stored in only uh, as one integer or so only four bytes. So in terms of compression, it's not good. So if you have large data, typically you will want to use a more uh, dedicated file format, typically CDF or HGF, HGF file. And the idea is that Within these five formats, you already you have uh, an organization that allows you to store data efficiently and uh, in an organized way with the data itself, with metadata about how the data was created, maybe with already some slices in the data to help for visualization. You see here an example with a root directory with two subdirectories within the files, within the, the file. So the sim out, which maybe is an output of simulation, and then uh, this with images, a data table, which is both part of two uh, of the two directories, and then here's some additional data. And you see that this is all organized into a single file, with, uh, which is compressed, and which you can write and read with the specific tools. So, here is an example in uh, C on how to write or read this type of file. You typically uh, just include the HDF5 library, and it, there's a library in nearly all of the languages that are typically used in the same trick world. <coughs> and then here you see an example where there is a simple loop here to generate data. And then a, loop, a line here that opens the file and gives some information about uh, the configuration of the file itself. And then you can create or open a data set inside the file. I show you the multiple directories, with multiple data sets that can live in the file. And then you can write a data set or read it and then close the file. So it's very similar to the idea of opening a file, writing in it, closing it. It's a, except that you are using the specific library that compresses for you, that uh, organizes the data for you. Also, if you have a file and you don't have, a, uh, you don't want to use it in your language, you can use command line uh, tools, such as h5 import or h5 them to see the content of the data set. So here I have, random data which has I created by uh, just using random numbers. If I have this, then I create a configuration file with information, meta information about the data. So the fact that uh, it's 14 point 64 bits, I, uh, I define here the architecture and the uh, byte order, which is very classic for the time it will not change. But if you have this file and this one with this command, you can produce the HGF file. So you don't actually need to use a library. There are command line tools to build the files and to read from them. And then you see here, <clears throat> if I jump the content of the file, there's a root group with one data set, which is of data type, this one. And it says, okay, dimension is uh, 10, and I have here the data. Okay, so simply uh, 
a way to organize data inside the file, which you can then store, share, and so on. So I've shown multiple file formats, and here I have a slide with, uh, summarizing the most generic recommendation. So when you have metadata, so information about experiments or information about data, most of the time you will be happy to store it in a any or YAML or JSON uh, file. And if you have data, if you have small data in the order of kilobytes, then CSV file is very fine because it's very easy to manipulate, to read, to write, and to modify by hand. If the data grows a bit large, you will always have the opportunity to compress with uh, GZ or Z or any other method the CSV file. There are some libraries that are able to manipulate compressed CSV files directly, but otherwise you compress it when you store it, and the the uh, you already, you also have the option to just uncompress it when you are uh, writing it. Then, if the data grows a bit larger, in the order of gigabytes, uh, it becomes really interesting to look at the HDF file uh, system format. Uh, sorry, file format. So do not carry around CSV files that are multiple gigabytes uh, in size. It's a waste of space and a waste of time because whenever you need to read it, you need to uh, parse it and transform every character string into integers or floating points, which you do not, do not need to do with an AGF file form. Also, if you are using NetCDF or whatever, you can actually work on the file uh, in parallel with on multiple computers. If you really have huge data, uh, terabytes or multiple terabytes, it might be an option to look at both databases and object storage. Uh, but then it's another game, but it's also very playable. Also important, use dedicated libraries to write and read them. Even a simple file format such as the CSV is very important to use an already existing library rather than trying to um, read it by yourself. Typical example is when you try to read a CSV file and you split the character string of each line with the commas, and you are basically enough to have a comma in one of the one of the feeds, your code will fail. Okay, so if you have, uh, if I take back example here, if in this character string I have a comma, you already understand that it's not sufficient to split on the codes. You also have to interpret the codes or the web codes that are, and then the more uh, info, the more uh, effort you put in to writing a correct parser. Uh, the less uh, interesting is it with this because in all the language you already have parsers for this type of file format. So use a dedicated libraries. That's very important. Okay, so I will uh, speak a bit about the object stores, except if there are questions. Uh, and I see a question in the chat. What actually defines a file format? It follows a particular, a particular syntax, a bit like a coding language. Uh, so yes, the file format defines how the information is organized in the file. So the first thing the file format def uh, defines is whether the file is a text file or a binary file. If the text file, if the file is a text file, the file format dictates the syntax of the of the file, just like the syntax of the language. Uh, and if uh, it's a binary file format, the, the format dictates the meaning of every byte. So maybe the first byte is an identifier of the file format, and then the second byte is the length of the file itself, and then uh, and, and so on, just like a protocol is defined. Okay, then I will talk a bit about object storage, uh, which is one of the four type of storages I showed earlier in the slide. <coughs> and uh, just to show you that there are three main options for file search, which you might have heard of, uh, Swift, S3, and Ceph. It's 
uh, often built on the original coding, which is a, a way of making sure the information is not lost when a disk fails, which is important. Uh, actually, the all these uh, the, all these uh, stores have uh, uh, features that are very interesting for administrators, a bit less for users, but uh, it's used a lot in the uh, web world, and I think some applications are coming from the scientific world. So in the future, you will see more and more object stores uh, used uh, alongside the clusters. But at this point, just, just to show you an example of how to use it. This is an example in uh, Python using the photo uh, package, and I am accessing a Ceph cluster or Ceph storage. You see that uh, it's not sufficient to give the name of the file to open a file, you need to create a connection first, where you provide an access key and a, a secret key. And then you need the IP address or name of uh, the one of the members of the object store cluster. And then when you have a connection, you can create buckets, which can be thought of as directory, but there is no, there is no hierarchies in buckets, it just Bucket. And then you can create keys. So the typical idea in an object store is that you have a key that uh, identifies some object. Object can be a file, but it can be uh, other information. And here you see an example of creating a new key with a string hello.txt. So it looks like a text uh, name, uh, sorry, a file path, but I could have chosen anything here. And I can create an object from a string like this. And importantly, I can set metadata. So uh, you've seen on file system, you have some metadata like ownership, uh, permissions, dates of creation or modification. And here, the metadata is arbitrary. So you can decide what the metadata is. So if you want to associate a particular uh, experiment reference or a uh, um, GOI of a paper which uh, has published results based on those data, whatever you want, you can add additional data to the data to make that. Data. Here you see another example where I create a new key and I upload simply a file. The nice thing about the object store, uh, because the way you access it is through an IP address and some credentials, you can generate URLs. So you can ask the system, okay, give me a, a unique URL, and then this URL allows you to download the file, simply putting it in your browser or whatever. So the idea is that if you have an object in an object store, it's very easy to share it with other people or to use it on multiple clusters. You don't need to have a mount point on the cluster. When you have a data file, on a home directory, it can only be used from all the, class, the compute nodes which are mounting this uh, home directory. Here, you can use it from ever, anywhere in the world. You can, you, you want to, to use it, provided of course that the access to this machine has been open in the firewalls and so on. But the idea is that technically there's no uh, difficulty in sharing this type of files. So it's very much suited for a one write and multiple reads when you have a base data set which you need to uh, uh, process from multiple clusters it's a very good option and the idea is that on a, a self cluster if you lose multiple disks or multiple machines you can always replace the parts that are failing without interruption of service which is a bit different from um, <clears throat> an nfs server where if the server dies the information is not available anymore. So just to let you know that object stores exist and that they are useful when you have large files that should be accessible from uh, uh, from anywhere in the world and uh, which are not going to be modified a lot. Then I will go to the other type, which is the database. We talk about the relationship Relational Database Management System, or DBMS. Uh, it's mostly used and needed for categorical data. So when you have uh, data which 
in uh, mix numbers uh, and uh, character strings. Let's see. So it's not really suited for matrices, but could be good for end, re end results. Uh, all the RDBMS engine have a very fast indexing system, which makes finding a single piece of data very, very fast. It's also able to encode uh, relationships between the data, like constraints and so on. And uh, they have features that make sure that actually if you're using such a system, you will not uh, end up with a, a system which is corrupted. I will show you an example of a corrupted file a bit later on. So when you write a file, the file could be corrupted in some bad cases. Uh, with a database management system, it will most of the time not be the case. So just to show you uh, a bit more how it works, it's all based on the tables where we have a row, which is called a tuple, and a column, which is called an attribute. And we have multiple tables. Like here, I have one table here with three uh, attributes, a login, a first name, and a last name. And I have uh, here another table, which is called uh, uh, here a related table, uh, where the login column in this table is linked to the login column in this table. <clears throat> and so this stores information that login Mark has first name Samuel and last name Clemens, and he has a he has a phone number which is this one. So the same information could be stored in a CSV file, for instance, by simply adding one attribute, adding one attribute here, which would be the look the phone. But actually, uh, this allows you to have multiple phones. So if Mark has two phone numbers, you will have just two entries in this column with Mark this phone number and then Mark this other phone number. And uh, you would be able to sort that information. By contrast with a CSV file, if you have multiple phone numbers, then you will need to find a workaround. This type of system is uh, queried through a specific language, which is common to all the file systems, uh, sorry, the uh, database system, which is called SQL. So it looks like this. You have commands to create tables. So this is a table. Commands to insert data into the table to populate the table with values. And then you have this type of uh, uh, command, the select, where you, you select columns from a table where some uh, criterion is met. So this gives you the uh, uh, this information. So this and this, because I'm asking for the first and last from users. So this is the table users, where the login is blank. And the thing is that the uh, engine is very fast, thanks to the indices, to find this information. And when the information is uh, distributed into multiple tables, you can use a join, as we call it. Uh, so you can join this table with this table. You just specify that this and this are the same thing. And then it creates a view where one column is added here, but it's a, it's a view, it's not how it's stored, it's just how it's presented. This system requires a uh, service to run on the machine. So you maybe have heard of an SQL or MySQL server. So there's a server to which you connect to write to the tables. But actually, if you don't have access to a server, there are options to read and write files as if there were a relation, a relational database. So the most known and used is SQLite. So if you have a program that you want to write and read, uh, tables with relationships and constraints and make sure that if there's a problem like a poor cut while you are writing the file or if there are multiple processes writing to the same file and you want to make sure that there's no issue, you should write to an SQL file, SQL uh, light uh, file and you should use the, the same uh, query language as I shown before rather than accessing a remote server, you're just writing on the file. 
just like with uh, the file systems, there are libraries to do that. So uh, here is an example in Python where you can import a SQLite tree. So the package that reads and uh, writes a SQLite files, you actually connect to it as if it were a server, but actually it's a file on the file system. And then you have exactly the same type of construct as if you were connecting to a uh, remote database system. You see here a create table the insert into just to populate the file. So the idea is that uh, SQLite will handle the fact that multiple uh, processes try to write information in the same in the same uh, table, for instance. If you open a file, which is a CSV file from multiple computers and try to write information <laughs> at multiple places, you will end up with a complete mess. Uh, but that will not be the case if you're using this type of system. So this is an um, SQL uh, request. So we call these SQL databases. And by contrast, people have think they have created no SQL databases. So not only SQL. And these are uh, database management systems that take care of very specific types of data. For instance, key value, like Redis is a type of database where you can store keys and values just like in, uh, a dictionary. If you are uh, <clears throat> familiar with the Python language and you know what a dictionary is, so it's a structure, a data structure in memory that associates some in object with a key. Uh, you can use Reddit to actually store that information in a, a database rather than in memory. So that's used in services where you have multiple programs that need to share data. It can be an option to share the data. Graph databases, they uh, allow you to store graphs or so networks, so social networks, communication networks, whatever, everything that has edges and nodes and uh, edges that connect nodes to other nodes. This type of um, um, uh, databases, they know the structure of the data in it. So if you are storing a graph, these database systems are able to give you the neighbors of one node or the neighbors of the neighbors of the node uh, without the need for you to actually compute it. It's, uh, they all have their query system, which is specific, but that allow you to uh, create requests on this graph or structure of graphs that are of higher level than if you were storing, for instance, an agency matrix on disk. So assume that you have an agency matrix on the disk. If you want to find the neighbors of uh, the neighbors of, uh, <clears throat> of some nodes, you need to perform some matrix operations to extract the information, and you need to do that by yourself. While if you are using Neo4j, for instance, you can simply query, okay, what are the neighbors of the neighbors of this node? Column databases have been created by contrast with the relationship uh, relation database systems, which are much more uh, record, so line oriented. In a database system, you most of the time manipul manipulate rows. So you, create, you insert a row or you delete a row. While here, those, file, uh, those um, database systems are designed to manipulate columns. So you can uh, modify a column, transform it to extract some uh, statistics about the column. And then the final type of NoSQL database is a document database, such as MongoDB or Elasticsearch, uh, <clears throat> where basically you store that their information, which is not structured. You simply can store a dictionary or key values or a list or whatever uh, type of data you want in those uh, in those database systems. Just like SQLite uh, allows you to you to store information as uh, to a file as if it were to a system, the TinyDB library uh, allows you to store information as if it were a MongoDB uh, server, but on 
disk. So it's exactly the same based on files, but you have a document database, so you can use all the uh, the tools of the library that manage uh, documents to store in the file. So I'm always talking about the file option because on the clusters you can read files, but you cannot easily start the server. You cannot easily start a MySQL server or a MongoDB server. Uh, but you can very easily use those type of files just to uh, do as if you had access to a server. So TinyDB is used just like MongoDB. It's uh, really a drop-in replacement rather than using uh, Py, uh, Mongo, you just use a TinyDB and then the insert and query is exactly the same as on the MongoDB. So you see here, you have dictionaries, this is a Python example, and you insert directly dictionaries into the data store and you can retrieve entire dictionaries uh, provided you give the reference to it. And you can search easily, for instance, okay, I want all the dictionaries where the value associated to the key name is John, and you just write it like this. So uh, when to use a database, um, when you have a large number of small files and you need to perform a lot of diet writes or you need to perform a lot of diet writes in a large file, it's a situation where you might want to consider using a database system rather than a flat file. Also, when you need to keep structure or relationships between the data, uh, as I said earlier, the uh, relationship, relational database systems allow you to encode constraints in data or relationship between columns of our records. Uh, so this is your case. And also when files are updated by several processes, and I, I, explained, I, I mentioned this already uh, early on, on just to show you the dangers of uh, writing at the same time on one file from multiple computers. Here's an, uh, <clears throat> a warning in the NFS uh, FAQ. So you remember that NFS is the uh, network file system which is used typically for the home, so the home uh, directories on the cursors. And it's okay, um, uh, can it become corrupted? And the answer it explains why. And here is just an example. So <clears throat> this is an old slide, as you can see, because the name here of the cluster is HMAN, which is an old cluster that has been decommissioned since then. But if you uh, have attended the slum session, you should understand what is going on, what is going on here. So basically, I'm asking the system for uh, four CPUs on four distinct nodes. And then when the allocation is uh, given, I can see here that I have been allocated one CPU on four of distinct nodes. And then this command line is a bit long, but basically it, uh, it's very easy to understand what it does. It does on each of the compute nodes, there's a for loop, which simply writes in a file called test file, but it's the same file for all CPUs. All compute nodes. It writes the number of the compute nodes, so zero for this one, one, two, and three, and then followed by a number, which is a number that goes from zero to this number. <clears throat> so if everything goes right, we should see something like this a number, which is zero, one, and two, or three, and then a very large number. And you see that the beginning of the file as the structure that we are expecting it to have. But this is a very large file. And if I look a bit uh, more in detail, so I'm using the grep command just to remove all the lines in the file that have this correct format. And I end up with a quite an amount of lines which are uh, complete garbage and they are not, a, not at all what we are expecting simply because there were multiple processes from multiple uh, computers trying to write in the same file on the network process. Okay, if 
this test file had been an SQLite file, it, this would not have happened. So it's important when you are writing multiple results from multiple compute nodes into a same location. Uh, this is really a use case to use a database system. When not to use a database system is when you only have sequential access. So if, when you have a very large file, but you only read it once from zero to the end, then uh, a file is perfectly fine. Uh, the, the database system is uh, more used for discrete writes at multiple places in the file in a random fashion. But if you are purely sequential, files are okay. Uh, <clears throat> and also if you have simple matrix vector, if you have a vector with uh, 1000 elements, there's no need to create this whole database system around it. You can just do it in the file, of course. And also if you have direct access on fixed size of records and no specific structure. So if you have an array of structs as we often have in uh, scientific data and it's uh, simple, then maybe there's no need for the whole, um, the, uh, whole system of the data system. Are there any questions of the, on this uh, section? Just again, just to show you that some tools exist that can help you prevent uh, issues that you might have when you have to write and, and read multiple pieces of information into the same uh, location or the same file. We'll go to the second part, which is about uh, data transfer. Because most of the time your data is maybe in the file and you need to transfer the file either from your laptop to a cluster or from the home directory in the cluster to the scratch directory on the cluster. And a typical use, a typical tool for uh, copying data from one computer to another is SCP. If you attended the SSH session, uh, then you learned about SCP. It's the most direct and easy way to copy data from one computer to another one, but actually uh, it's pretty inefficient. And if you look at even the release notes of OpenSSH uh, itself, it says that SCP is outdated, inflexible, and not uh, readily fixed. So when you are experiencing issues with SCP, the alternative is SFTP. So SFTP works much better behind the scenes than SCP, but it's used a bit differently. For those of you who know what an FTP server is, uh, SFTP works much more like FTP except that it's secure. So the idea with SFTP is that you can connect to, so here is the name of my laptop. I run SFTP and then LM3, which is my shortcut for the method three. And then you see that there are multiple comments that I can use to either navigate the remote file system or the local file system. And there are comments to put and get files um, to the system. So if you are experiencing issues with SCP, just try SFTP. Another good option is rsync. So rsync is another tool that allows copying data from one computer to another computer. Uh, but uh, the nice thing about rsync is that it, it can be used to only transfer uh, modified information. So you, when you have a whole directory on one computer and you want to have the same directory on another computer, you can use recursive SCP or recursive SFTP. But if you have already a copy and then you modify one or two files in the source directories and you want to replicate this in the remote directory, rsync is a tool that will compare all the sizes and uh, timestamps of the files in the source directory. And if they match on the remote directory, they will not, it will not transfer data. So if you have 1,000 files and only one is modified, and you use rsync to resynchronize to higher keys, to directory higher keys, uh, then you will uh, only transfer that one file that was uh, modified. <coughs> rsync accepts a very large number of parameters, but the two most important are A and G. Uh, it's just the same defaults. 
but by default it will not preserve ownership it will not preserve permissions and so on if you want to be uh, to to behave it if you want it to behave in a natural way uh, use a and z arguments and then you can use dash v and dash dash progress to have feedback about which file it is uh, uh, copying and how much of that file it has been copying already you can use dash dash include or exclude to include or exclude specific directories or files from the source to the target. Example, if you want to uh, copy a, a source code, which is in the version with Git, and you want to copy only the source code and not the whole Git directory, dash git directory, dot git directory, you can use that dash exclude dot git. And so you only have the code and not all the, the, the history. And then you have options to uh, delete files so by default when you are sync uh, one directory to another it will um, make sure that anything new in the uh, source directory uh, arrives in the destination directory but if something is removed from the, the, the from the source directory it's not removed by default from the destination directory and if you want that you need to use dash dash delete and then you can use also remove source file, which is the other way around. Interestingly, you can use also that dry run if you want to uh, run a command, uh, srun command, and you are not exactly sure about what it will be doing. You can use dry run with uh, the vib, for instance, and it will show you exactly the file that uh, will be transferred. And then these are options uh, to use if you are not sure about the metadata. The, so I said earlier that if the file has either the size that it's changed or the um, timestamp, uh, then our sync will copy it. But if you know that the timestamp are broken and you should not rely on it, you can use dash dash signs on it. And if you uh, know that the size could be the same but the file has been modified, you can use dash dash checksum. And then uh, our sync will really compute a checksum on the file on the source. And if it's not the same as the file on the uh, destination, it will copy it. So our sync is a very nice tool to have in your uh, tool belt. Our sync can also be used to resume a transfer. So assume that you are using SCP to copy a large file, and then for some reason, the uh, transfer is interrupted, either your laptop Wi-Fi has uh, disconnected, or the remote computer has rebooted, or whatever, <coughs> you end up with a partial file. So here you see an example of me copying a large file to a remote computer, and then I hit Control C to uh, stop the transfer, and then uh, I can resume the transfer with rsync. So simply replacing rsync instead of SCP uh, will um, make sure that you, sorry, the rsync with dash dash happen. Uh, if you use it like this, actually rsync will consider that the part of the file which is there already is good and it will only transfer the rest of the file. <coughs> okay, if you have SCP, you copy a file, it fails and you SCP again, SCP will start from scratch. SCP is not able to do anything else. But if you use rsync and that dash dash happen, uh, then you will be able to copy only the part which is left. So there are few use cases that are useful. Uh, just have a look at the main page and uh, uh, use a dry run option if you're not sure about what will happen if you run this specific command. You remember I talked to you about the inode problem, the number of uh, files in a file system can be very uh, problematic. And it's also the case for transferring data. If you have a large, large number of very small files, you can end up in a situation where you spend more time transferring metadata than transferring data. And actually you spend more time uh, working on the metadata than uh, transferring the, the file. So one option to sort that issue is to uh, first create an archive with DAR. You create a big file 
that holds all the small files you would want to transfer, and then you copy that big archive. Sometimes you do not have enough room or enough space on the file system where you have those multiple files to create an additional file that holds the same information. Uh, so you can do it on the fly. Here you see an example of a command line that uses the tar command to take all the files that are in this directory. And oh, this should be a C. And it should create an archive verbosely and it will compress it with GZ. And then I, I do not specify an output file, but directly I pipe this to a command, which is an SSH to another server, where I run the cat command to another file. Okay, this is a, a small recipe to uh, actually create a file on the source computer. Well, actually, the file is created on the remote computer, but the files are taken from the uh, local computer. So you see the ID. You have a directory with a large number of files. You do this, and you end up with a single file with all the files in it on a remote computer. So if you want to keep a, a, a copy of this uh, directory for uh, the uh, archiving, for instance, is a very nice option. This can be much faster than using RC that will first have to compare all the files. You can do it in the other way around. And uh, if you are <clears throat> um, familiar enough with the piping of programs into one another, you can use a PV command in between here just to get a progress bar. So it's been a very nice uh, visual feedback of the progress of the CP. Another option and the replacement to SCP is BBCP. So if you remember earlier, I said that uh, BBC, uh, SCP was inefficient because actually it does a lot of uh, network operations that are not necessary. So it, SCP is not able to use the full bandwidth of the network. Uh, <clears throat> BBCP is a tool which is very easy to install by yourself. Uh, that allows to create multiple streams of data on the same uh, network connection to be able to use the full network connection capacity. So it works exactly like SCP, except that you specify the number of streams that you can use. And you see here an example on a typical gigabit link, so a typical link that you have between computers in a data center. And you see basically that the data rate is double simply because the simple SCP command is not able to use the full bandwidth capacity, the full capacity of the network. And the faster the network, the more important the difference between BBCP and SCP becomes. So this is a nice little tool also to have when you have the feeling that the connection, the transfer rate is not good enough compared to the specifications of the network, you can try to use BBCP rather than SCP. The thing is that BBCP will open multiple ports on the uh, destination computer, so the firewalls need to allow them. So it will not work from one university to another, for instance. But inside the data center uh, machines that are on the same network, it should work pretty easy. Another option is, uh, to use parallel RSync. If you attended the, set, the lecture on uh, introduction to parallel computing, I have discussed the GNU parallel tool. And GNU parallel actually works pretty well with RSync. And this is an example taken directly from the uh, uh, GNU parallel website. So the same idea here, uh, RSync is based on SSA, so uh, just like SCP is. So you can end up with uh, performances that are a bit below compared to what the uh, uh, hardware uh, should offer. Then it's good idea to try to run this in parallel. Also, if RSync has to uh, pass a lot of, or has to uh, go through a lot of directories to fetch a lot of files, 
you can split the directories into multiple rsyncs to uh, speed up the things. Again, the idea is that rsync can be slower than what the file system can offer in terms of performances. And in that case, it's a good idea to try do it in uh, parallel. Okay, so I've discussed a few tools, like most importantly, uh, rsync and um, the way that you can run rsync in parallel with the GNU parallel option when you transfer data from one computer to another. Then I will move to the third and final part, which is about data share. And I will show you how to share data both with other users on the same cluster, so other CC users, and also with external users. So people that are, who are not part of the CC universities. So first, uh, how do you share data with <coughs> uh, users from the CC? Uh, I will first give you a small reminder of the Unix permissions. So you know that uh, a file can have three types of permissions associated to it. Read, write, and execute. <clears throat> and these three permissions are assigned to the user, to the group of the user, and to anyone. So the file uh, is a file permission is determined by three times three options. Here you see it's here uh, read, write, read, write, read. And so this means that the user can read and write the file. The people in the same group can read and write the file, and people who are not the user and not in the same group, but who have access to the same machine can read but not write the file. So there are, uh, there's a um, binary representation and octa representation, which you do not need to uh, learn, but basically you will see this number a lot, 640, 644. So it's, look, it's, uh, Another way to write this, which is more uh, close to the machine representation. And then there's another thing, which is called a set UID and set GID bit, uh, <clears throat> which is a bit more complicated to understand, but the set GID bit uh, is important for directories, and I will show you a bit later on, because it's uh, a good way to, to share data with people from your group. And later is actually no. So here I'm connected to a cluster. And with the ID command, you see that I have information about me, my user, my UID, and it gives me the groups to which I am a member of. So I have a primary group and then I have additional groups. Here you see an example of me creating a directory and changing the permissions. On the directory. So here it's 750, which means me, I can read, write, and execute. And actually, for directory, execute means go to it. People in my group can read and execute, but not write, and other people cannot see anything. So if I um, use ls l or ll, you see exactly what I've uh, explained here. With the change group command or chdrp, I can change the group ownership. So if I, my primary group is grp pan, and so when I create a directory, its group ownership is my primary group. I can change that with the G change group command, and I say, okay, I am also part of the, this group, and I want this. Um, this directory to be part of that group. And then you see, if I use ls again afterwards, you see that the group information is changed. And as you can be part of multiple groups, you can selectively share data with one group or another based on the ownership of the uh, directory. So this directory in this state can be read and traversed by people of this group. Uh, while in this state, it was readable and traversable by a member of this group. Okay, so you change the group ownership, you change the group of Unix users that have access to the file. Now, if I 
create a file in that in this directory, you see that by default, the group ownership of the file is my primary group. And this sometimes can be an issue because if you want to create files in this directory, which is shared with this group, and you do it like this, you will need to change the group of the ship of the file that you create every time you create a file. Okay, you understand that if the group of the ship of the directory is something, but the files in it are have a different group ownership, then you are missing the point because your people, your uh, Collaborators will be able to look at the content of the directory, but not to look at the files in the directory. And that you can prevent with the set GID bit, and you can set it like this. So with the change mode command, the same command that you can use to change the permissions because it's a permission in itself. You, you write G plus S, so it's set GID bit on the test directory. When you create a file in this directory, you see I create test file two here. You see that without any change group afterwards, the group of ownership of this new file is the same as the file, as the directory uh, in which it is created. So you see the idea, if you want to be systematic and make sure that all the files in the directory which you share with some specific group uh, can be shared by your group when, when you create it. You just use this to assign the uh, GID bit to the directory. And so whenever you will create a file in that directory, uh, its group ownership will be changed to the one of the current directory. Then I will show you uh, a bit more in detail the uh, X here, which for a file indicates that the file can be executed. And for a directory, I told you, it means that the directory can be traversed. It can be used to hide files from people. Uh, here you see two, uh, two screens. So here I am me on uh, some cluster. And here I am some other user. I, I training user on the same cluster. <clears throat> and you see that the permissions on my home directory are readable, writable, and, and traversable for me, readable and traversable for my group, so GRP path, and only traversable for other people. And this user does not belong to my group. So as this user, when I try to list the content of this directory, it says that the permission is denied because listing the content would have required the read permission to be set here. But as the traversal permission is set, this user can read the content of the file provided they know the name file. So if you change your permission on your directory, on your home directory like this. Nobody can come in your directory and browse around. But if you want to share a file with one specific person, you can say, okay, in my directory, there's a file called this name. And then this, this person would be able to see the content, uh, even though they are not able to change directories into your own directory and not able to list the content. Okay, so it's an easy and simple way to share it now with a specific person. <clears throat> Another way to uh, share data, but make sure that only the needed people can access it, the people who need it can access it, is to encrypt it. And that is very easy to do with uh, the tools that are basically installed on any Linux system, so also on the clusters. If I have a file here, I can use OpenSSL, and then I use this kind of comment where I uh, OpenSSL is a command that does a lot of different things. So you need to specify a sub command. Here it's the three, for instance. And I specify the file that I want in and the name of the file that I wanted to create. And this will encrypt this file and it will ask for a encryption password. So I need to choose a password. I need to set it twice. So you know most of the time when you choose a password, you need to make sure that you did not blunder. Uh, and then I get this file, which is complete garbage if you don't have the, uh, the, 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 
encryption key. And so you can put this file on the file system, which is open to anyone. And the idea is that you transmit the password to only the people you want to have access to this file. And the people who have both the file and the key can decrypt with this uh, type of command. You see uh, the difference here and here is the dash T here for decrypt and the fact that the input is now the encrypted version and the output is a file name that you choose. <clears throat> okay, so when you don't have the opportunity to create a group or to play with the permissions and you are forced to put a file maybe on a public file system or public FTP system, uh, uh, it's a good way to just encrypt it and then you give the file to anybody you want, anybody, uh, but you give the key only to people who need to access it and with a, a small command like this I can see the problem. Okay, so you see that using the permissions, playing with the executable bit or the directories, playing with the set GID bit, playing with um, the uh, OpenSSL to encrypt, you can basically do any type of sharing you want on, this, on, the, on the cluster. Now, if you want to share with uh, external users, it's a bit different because of course, the external users do not have access to the same cluster as you. So you cannot say, okay, as a file in my home directory, I set it as read, world readable. The people who are not able to connect to the cluster, they will never have access to that file. So a tool that is very handy is called uh, Nextcloud. And I know that there's an instance of Nextcloud that has uh, Unamur and also at ULB. We also have an instance here at UCL. I'm not sure what the other uh, uh, the other universities, uh, but basically here at, U at UCL, you have access to an Nextcloud instance where you can access it with your CISM login. And it looks exactly like a Dropbox for those of you who have already used Dropbox in the past. So there's a website where you can copy file and then you can share files and you have, can also have a copy on your, on, the, on your laptop, which is synchronized with the cloud. All those functionalities are present in the same way with um, uh, Nextcloud. So here you see a screenshot of in the Nextcloud uh, uh, homepage. At some point, I might say on cloud rather than Nextcloud is the other name, but the, the, the information is the same. Uh, the nice thing here is that you see I have files here and I have those type, sorry, I have directories here and I have three directories with a uh, arrow going out of them. And these are actually connectors because Nextcloud allows you to define connectors. And a connector is a way to uh, import in a way the data from another computer into this the Nextcloud system. So here you see <clears throat> three connectors to three uh, system. Actually, the, the green system was a cluster a few years ago, it's not available anymore. But you see that I'm using SFTP as the language to connect to the cluster. I just specify the name of the, the cluster, my user ID, my password, and the path of my home directory if I want to share my home directory. And you see that I can do that for multiple, uh, multiple uh, servers. And then you see here I have a directory, which is actually a view of my files on the cluster. And then I think, uh, so if I click on man back here, I end up here. And these are actually the files that I have in my home directory on man back. And the nice thing is that I can share, I can create a share link, just like in Dropbox, for this file which is on the cluster. And then I can specify a password and an expiration date. And when I have this link, I can share it with anybody in the world and they can click on the link in their browser and they will, end up, uh, they will uh, see a 
page like this, where they can just click to download the file. So the file is on a computer to which they do not have access, but thanks to the SFTP connector on Nextcloud and the uh, URL file sharing on Nextcloud, you can share the file with anybody in the world, provided that you give them the URL. And if you password protected the file, provided that you uh, give them the uh, password. So this is very useful if you have data in mass storage, for instance, and you want to share it with people who do not have the same access. You can use just Nextcloud to hand out URLs to your files. Any question about Nextcloud? So anyone can request a, a CSM account here at the university and get access to this. Uh, for the other university, you would need to query with your local uh, uh, support. Another way to share data uh, is with Dataverse. And when you publish a, a, a paper, we know that the paper gets assigned a DOI, which uniquely identifies the paper and allows you to reference it in multiple, uh, multiple ways. And uh, imagine that you want to share data alongside with the paper. This system is designed to do that. So the, the data which is um, shared through Dataverse is assigned a DOI. So you see here the website, you see multiple data verses as it's called, so it's like multiple directories. And inside the dataverse, you can have uh, data files and you see here, well, you, maybe you don't see it, but actually if you look at the slides, you will see it. There's a DOI here. So every data set is assigned a DOI. And once the data set has been published, it cannot be modified. So it really uh, is like uh, papers, when you publish a, a, a paper, you cannot modify it afterwards, except if you submit an errata, which goes to the same process, and then you have an errata that is published. With uh, data, it's the same thing. If you publish data, you know how to modify it. You need to specify a new version and publish a new version, and you get a new DOI uh, uh, assigned. So uh, we are currently working on integrating uh, all the uh, different uh, open data solutions available in the Federation and Brussels to try to have something which is centralized. Uh, but the whole idea of fair data and open data will be explained uh, in detail this afternoon by uh, adding her uh, in the same room here. So, do you have any questions about this part? So, when you want to share data with people all around the world, of two options, either uh, Nextcloud with the connector to just create a new URL linking to a file on your uh, mass storage, for instance, or Dataverse where you can really publish a data set alongside, for instance, a paper. And the data set would be referenced just like a paper uh, in a journal. Can. So in summary, um, it's important to choose the right file system and the right file format and uh, give other storage systems and file systems some consideration. When you see that it doesn't work with files, you see that your files are being corrupted or it's very long or it's very, sorry, very slow. <coughs> uh, you can look at the pointers that I gave in the slides to see if there's not an a relationship that a relational database system or a NoSQL system that would make your workflow faster. For instance, if you remember, if you attended the workflow session by David, he mentioned that behind the scenes it's a MongoDB that holds all the details of the jobs uh, simply because it's much more reliable than a set of files. Uh, for the transfer, you can use parallel tools when possible. So you remember I talked about BPCB, also about rsync and the fact that rsync can be used with GNU parallel to create parallel streams uh, of data for transferring data. It's important when the transfer rates you observe from the, the transfer is uh, not as good as the hardware specifications of the uh, network system on which, through which is going 
uh, to transfer the data, you can use parallel streams to use up all the bandwidth capacity of the system. And then for sharing, you can use all the potential of the Unix permissions to share data with groups, with other people by hiding, with other people by encrypting and sharing on the keys and so on. And uh, also you are encouraged to try Nextcloud and Dataverse to share your data with all the world. So typically Nextcloud for work in progress and data, Dataverse for uh, uh, <clears throat> final versions of data alongside the 